Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. We welcome all of you across America and around the world, and particularly all of you listening in India now, to without question our Bloomberg conversation of the day on the historic moment for the Indian people. Raghurajan is at Booth School. He's a Miller professor at Booth School. His financial book on the crisis of 07 08 won every award, Fault Lines. He is one of our great financial professors and, of course, a former head of the Central Bank of India. Far more importantly, as always, Rajan out front, he has a book he is delivering, Breaking the Mold on his India. It will be a definitive 270 pages. Uh, look for that from Princeton University Press shortly. Raghu, thank you so much for sending me the PDF of the book. I'm going to cut to the chase, uh, Professor. The final sentence of your book, they cannot have any more excuses. What are the excuses Modi has now, and what does he need to move India to a new prosperity? Well, uh, we have an election. Uh, the results have uh, been coming out, and, and I think it's a splendid result because it tells the government it needs to change course. The old course was unviable, and we can talk about that. Of course, markets seem to be disappointed. We can talk about that also, why markets are reacting negatively. But I think what is happening today is really, in the long run, really good for India because it forces India to choose a different course from the one it has been on, a course which has led to much wider unemployment and distress than needed in the country. Is this an election result that you see will bring the technocratic and elite South together with a more emotional and historic North? Does it bring the polarity of India together or do we have a more separate India in 2026? No, it's, it's actually a win for democracy and that's good for India because what democracy does is it allows the different parts to essentially express themselves and to negotiate. The problem uh, earlier was India was trending towards a more autocratic country, a country with one leader who, was, uh, who had a larger than life image. And that unfortunately meant that uh, the BJP leadership wasn't listening, wasn't listening to the economic news on the ground that people were actually suffering hardship, wasn't listening to the broader sense that uh, you know the weaponization of various right. instruments of the government to put uh, you know opposition party leaders in jail was simply not gelling and it would have taken india down a course which was ruinous in the longer run maybe in the short run right. beneficial to the big big uh, business groups and that's why the market is reacting adversely but i think right. this is good uh, Ragan Rajan with us with the Booth School Chicago. We welcome all of you on YouTube worldwide and particularly in South Asia. My colleague Damien Sassar to Professor Rajan. Professor Rajan, you have mentioned the concept of an authoritarian democracy and how India is moving into that sort of bucket. Talk to us a little bit about what this election means for India and what it means for Narendra Modi and some of his policies on labor and whatnot. So I think the key number to look at in this election is the BJP's own seats in parliament. They almost surely will fall short of a majority, which means that they have to actually take the support of, uh, of other parties, convince them to stay on board, which means they have to be much more sensitive to a broad-based uh, set of policies. Now, the BJP has done some very good things during its uh, stint in power. For example, it has improved the investment in infrastructure. Uh, and you can see roads, airports, uh, you know, highways becoming much better in India. That's good. However, what it has not articulated is a sensible policy for broad-based employment. And that almost surely requires policies on human capital, how to skill up the workforce, how to bring uh, you know, industry together with universities and so on to get people jobs. So the frustration with the BJP has been mass unemployment, which is uh, you know, in an authoritarian regime, they simply don't even acknowledge the fact that unemployment has been growing and is especially amongst the youth. So what this election has done is essentially given them a cold shower of reality, yep. that people are not happy with your policies. And that will force 
you know, if the BJP does come back uh, uh, to power with, uh, after negotiating with allies, it will force policies which are broader, more inclusive, and more sensitive to the needs of the people. That's a good thing. This morning, an extended interview with Raghun Rajan of the Booth School of Chicago. For those joining in America, a shock a result or beginning of results, I should say, in a Delhi election assumed to be dominant for Mr. Modi, and it was decidedly less so. My colleague, Damien Sassauer. Professor Rajan, I want to take you back to your uh, former role as director of research at the IMF. You're familiar with workers' remittances, the role they play in India. I mean, the role they play globally, 860 million of remittances in 2023. India is 15% of that. Talk to us about what this election means for the diaspora outside of India, about the flows of capital into India. Is this going to change things at all? Well, I, I think it's it can actually be good news, uh, both from the perspective, remittances will continue regardless of who's in power. This is more, you know, a lot of money coming from the Middle East, some from the uh, United States and Europe, uh, for people to their families. And that will continue. That There's no reason why that would uh, be disrupted. What is interesting, however, is foreign direct investment has been slowing into India over the last couple of years. Some people argue that uh, one of the reasons it has been slowing is that, uh, you know, people are worried about uh, arbitrary government policy to the extent that a more democratic uh, dispensation at the center creates more stability about government policies, especially right. it, uh, it uh, limits the weaponization of the tax authorities, of the investigative authorities, yeah. business actually will feel more comfortable. I, I hope and I, and I think it is quite possible that private investment, which has also been on the, on the down, as well as foreign direct investment, could pick up slowly yeah. as it sees policies uh, emerge, which are more comforting. Professor, within your new book, Breaking the Mold, and I, I guess the answer is for every central bank, the raging vogue now is to pull climate change into some form of monetary policy mandate from whatever the nation is. Climate change is reality in India. New Delhi today, I believe a high of 111, 114 Fahrenheit, who's counting. Professor, what does India do and what does Modi do to immediately break the mold on a climate change out of control? Well, this is uh, precisely what the book is about. Can India afford to become another China? Does the world have room for another China becoming a manufacturing giant? And that was the direction the Modi government was trying to go in, offering massive subsidies to capital intensive manufacturing. And it, you know, the reality is that uh, China is already there. Uh, there is very little place for another manufacturing giant, especially given the protectionism that's rife in the world. But India has a card up its sleeve. It actually is doing far better in services exports, which is much greener, much more sustainable. And you're seeing a huge growth in skilled services exported right. to the rest of the world, whether it's telemedicine, consulting, chip design, lots of new areas opening up. India accounts right. for five percent of global trade there. That's good. How do you unify a nation with over 20 languages? We in the United States are in a panic. I mean, there's two languages in Chicago, the Cubs and the White Sox. That's a different <laughs> story. But Raghu, how do you unify towards a new India around 20 disparate languages? Uh, Tom, it's 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 more than that. It's 20 official languages, which means they have enough people uh, speaking it. But there are 600 additional dialects and languages. It's a vast, complicated country. And the only way it's unified is through democracy, because democracy allows each uh, each community a voice. You talked about 2026 in India. That's when the parliamentary seats get reapportioned when uh, you know, uh, there will be a, a, a move to uh, you know, have new seats in parliament for the more populous areas. That has to be done by consensus. And what I'm so glad about is that it will be done by consensus because democracy has reestablished itself in India and, and they will have to negotiate how that reapportionment helps. So India is more politically stable 
as a result of this election is also going to be a greater friend right. to the democracies of the world. Now, Damien, I know one of your focuses is on India, Russia. And of course, it goes back to yeah. Nehru's visit in 1955 to Russia and all the responses through the 60s of John James, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith and Kennedy trying to reaffirm an American presence from a distance. That's absolutely right. And Professor Rajan, I'd really like to hear your opinion on the relationship between India and Russia. Obviously, they've been a big consumer of Russian barrels of Russian oil. And if you look at the tenure and the correlation between the Indian tenure and Brent crude, it is, it is pretty strong and has been since 2000. So talk to us a little bit about that relationship, India and Russia. Well, India um, sort of tilted towards Russia when uh, the U.S. tilted away from India. India and uh, the United States were, were quite friendly in the 60s. Uh, but then, uh, you know, as uh, the Bangladesh situation developed, uh, the U.S. tilted away from uh, India. And, and that's when Russia yeah. moved towards India. There was a strong friendship through the 60s, 70s and 80s. India buys a lot of military hardware from Russia, so it has been right. dependent. That has changed. Uh, uh, India increasingly is buying from the West, uh, you know, from France, from the United States, right. and that relationship is strengthening. Right. So, so this is a, a work in, uh, in process. India understands right. increasingly Russia is going to be dependent on China, right. which is uh, unfortunately uh, at this point, the relationship between India and China is one right. of antagonism. Uh, so, Ra Raghu, I've got time for one more question. I have to interrupt and be rude. If you are called upon by Mr. Modi, will you serve the Indian people within his new government? Well, uh, I, I think that's an unlikely prospect. Uh, you know, my uh, sort of inclination is whenever there's a government I can agree with, I'm happy to work with them. I've, I've always been open with advice. Let's see what happens. Roger, thank you so much. We're really anticipating Breaking the Mold, 270 pages from Princeton University Press. Look for that from Professor Rajan at the Booth School at Chicago.